Okay, so I'm going to go through a review of the Americas. Uh, ultimately, I'll go all the way up to 1900, but for this review, I'm going to go mainly from 1200 to 1750. Touch on a few things that go beyond that. So we're going to start with the Inca and the Aztecs, and then we'll get to the Europeans showing up. And so we want to understand a, a couple of different things. And, and so one is going to be, what do the empires that form here without European influence look like? What, what kinds of empires form? What are the characteristics? How are they similar to empires in other regions? How are they different? And then we want to look at the Europeans showing up, which only happens after 1492 when Columbus sails the ocean blue. And then we'll, uh, we'll see the new kind of maritime empire that the Europeans are uh, imposing on this area. We want, we want to look at things that diffuse to the Americas uh, and, and ways that those things are transformed as well. So in that period of time, one of the big things we're looking at is how did the economic developments of the early modern period transform the social practices in the Americas? So keep an eye on the big picture and, uh, and remember the details are used to support that, that bigger picture. All right. So the uh, starting point is going to be the Inca and Aztec empires, as I mentioned. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about the differences between the two, kind of big picture differences. The Aztec empire is uh, much less centralized than the Inca empire was. The, the Aztec empire, we'll see, is sometimes characterized uh, as a tributary empire. And here you can see it called the Triple Alliance, which is how it was uh, initially formed. And so the, the ci key cities around uh, the, the capital uh, of the Aztec Empire. And then the Inca Empire here on the right, we can see the map of the Inca uh, road system. And so it's a, a kind of an indication of the much greater degree of centralization we're gonna find there. So the starting point here, the Aztec Empire. And so the Aztec Empire, we want to kind of ballpark it in, in the late 1300s, so at the end of the post-classical era. Uh, and so kind of the bigger picture is that these societies are developing in isolation. The Atlantic Ocean was at that point, uh, you know, not the trading system it would become later. While the Vikings had crossed, they hadn't established a permanent connection. And so the last time there had been a permanent connection had been during the Ice Ages. Since then, people had, had, uh, had developed on their own. And so we could say this about the Aztec and Inca empires. Uh, they are more or less at the same stage of development in the 1300s as a lot of, of Eurasian empires were closer to zero. And so we would see kind of similar institutions developing on that kind of delay as a result of the, uh, the, the insulation from other societies. So when we, we talk about imperial expansion, one of the things that, uh, that we need to look at is what is it that is driving this society to expand? Is the Chinese, for instance, are, are largely not driven to expand. Confucianism doesn't provide much inspiration to expand. They, their economy is more or less self-sufficient in China, so that doesn't drive them to expand. But other societies like the Aztecs or like Western Europeans are driven to expand. So why? Well, here, uh, a lot of it is connected to religion. And so in the Aztec religion, we have this uh, traditional belief that they're building upon. So during the earlier classical period, we would have had the Mayan city-states. And the Mayan city-states had developed a religion or built on a religion. Uh, we're, we're not really sure which. That involved blood sacrifice. And, and this concept that blood sacrifice kept the world going. And, uh, and that could be a voluntary blood sacrifice, like you opening up a cut and, and bleeding it ritually on an altar or something along those lines. Or it can involve the involuntary sacrifice that we tend to see a lot more in the Aztec Empire, where you're holding somebody down, as we see in the picture here, carving out their heart while, it's still, while they're still alive. And then, depending on which ritual we're talking about, either putting the heart in this container that was meant to have the blood spill out as rays of the sun or burning the heart while the person is, is still in the process of dying. Uh, and whether the Aztecs actually believed they needed sacrificial victims in the numbers they took or whether this was 
kind of a reign of terror that they used. What we see is that the Aztecs uh, conquered other groups in order to take slaves that they could use for sacrifice. So the, the need for sacrificial victims we could see as a, an incentive to expand. The Aztec Empire establishing traditional imperial forms in an area where they would not have really been practiced before. So you would have, for instance, a great speaker who's an emperor, who's the one man in control of the entire empire. Similar to how we would have seen empires rising much earlier in places like Rome uh, or the Gupta Empire in India. But it's a new area. So this is the first time we see such a large empire in Central America. Uh, and as the Aztecs expand, they are conquering people who speak different languages and have different customs than their own. And, and unlike some of the other more centralized empires of the time, the Aztecs were more or less tolerant of that diversity. Uh, and so they would allow, for instance, a ruler to remain in control as long as the ruler paid tribute to the Aztecs. And that tribute was in the form of uh, wealth, like crops. Uh, it, was, it could be in the form of slaves, which were used for sacrifice. It, and it was definitely in the form of uh, military assistance to the Aztecs. So tribute is sort of like a tax. And so we would see far more effective tributary uh, connections during the post-classical era than, than had been established earlier on. Uh, and so one of the things that we looked at earlier in the era was how did empires govern diverse populations? So here for the Aztecs, the answer is to allow those diverse populations to remain diverse. They're not going to force them to speak a single administrative language or, or follow their religion or anything along those lines. All right, so the Aztec Empire then is not centralized in the way that the Chinese Empire would be, or, or even as we'll see the Inca Empire. Uh, as long as you were doing what you needed to do, you could remain autonomous, semi-independent. Okay, so the, uh, that is eventually going to work against them. When the Spanish show up, a lot of these tributary states resented the kind of tribute they were being forced to uh, pay the Aztecs and join the Spanish and thinking, what do we have to lose in rebelling against these people who are enslaving and, and sacrificing people? So I, I mentioned the, this drawing of similarities and differences to empires in, in Asia or in Africa. Uh, and so the, the Aztec empire then, <clears throat> in terms of the level of egalitarian uh, social structures and that sort of thing is, is much closer to empires in places like uh, Mali and West Africa than to the Chinese, which were much more centralized empire building on uh, <clears throat> earlier civilizations and trading links. We would see that the Aztec empire is similar to most other empires, to all other empires of its day, in, in having an economy that is based on agriculture. So in the bottom right, we can see the chinampas that are being built. These are the, the floating island fields that the Aztecs used, uh, which were tremendously productive. So in terms of looking at the Aztec Empire and looking at, say, Indian or Chinese empires, the Aztec Empire uh, had high, far higher regard for women. So while women were, were not equal to men, uh, there was still subordination, uh, women could inherit property, and, and women had a key role in grinding up the maize. Uh, and, and so there was a, a much higher regard for women's work than we would find in, say, China. Uh, and so again, closer to what we'd see in Western or Eastern Africa. The other uh, key difference is that the Aztecs, and we'll see this with the Inca too, tend to create these social uh, clan structures that had a different function than what we would see in the West or in, in, uh, in places to the East. So one, one of these is the Kalpuli. The Kalpuli was the Inca or the Aztec social structure, and it could range all the way from people who were considered to be elite all the way down to your poorest farmer. And so the Kalpuli tended to be effective at keeping social peace because there is this idea of reciprocal obligations. The people at the top, your elite, uh, 
they would uh, provide land for the people at the bottom to use in exchange for getting crops from people at the bottom. And so this uh, was effective enough that we, do, we, we don't have any accounts of large-scale peasant uprisings the way we would see in Western Europe or in China at this time. All right, so this is one of the accounts that uh, I'd like you to, to take a look at. This is a description of the Inca system that is often labeled by historians as socialist. All right, so taking a look at, at what we've got here, um, one, the author of this would admit that socialism may not be the right term because socialism is, is something that's created later during the Industrial Revolution. So technically, there was no such thing as socialism. But he argues that nevertheless, socialism is a good term for what the Inca did uh, because it, in the Inca Empire, we would see <clears throat> certain elements of of, uh, of economic practices we would see in in more extremely socialist societies. So it's it's on the far end of the extreme of socialism, but could be considered socialism nonetheless. So just like we see in Soviet Russia, uh, that the Soviets would have a government that controls all the farms in theory, and that the gov the government would control all the factories in theory. Uh, here, what the author is pointing out is that all labor was to some degree or another controlled by the, the Inca government. And the Inca government would tell you what you needed to do. Every different group of people had their own uh, obligations. Uh, in other parts of, the, of, of his account, the author talks about how the, uh, this labor would be recruited and how if you were working in one area and it was especially difficult, it mentions down here at the bottom that if it was really hard to do, they would rotate people through and rotate people from different regions. And you can see that it's, it says, it later became the principle of the Spanish Mita. So it's, it, there's going to be a continuity here in the use of this uh, labor tax, it, drafting people into a labor force. So <clears throat> looking at, at this, we have kind of the foundation of what we're looking at. The Inca society was able to mobilize resources in an area that was hard to, to survive in, which is the mountains. They're in the Andes Mountains at high elevation. Although this, the soil is fertile, it's really hard to use it because you have to terrace the, the soil. So that, that is part of the reason we get this kind of system. Otherwise, the farming would have been far less organized and therefore far less productive. Okay, <clears throat> so moving on to the Inca. Um, we can see like the Aztec Empire develops really late in the uh, post-classical era. It's often considered more of an early modern empire than a post-classical empire. But like the Inca built, or, or like the Aztecs, it built on earlier societies that had been established there. So we, we wanna look through kind of the same things. We've got the drive to expand. The Inca, like the Aztecs, were driven to expand to some degree, degree or another by religion. And so in the Inca system, you have kind of two things at play. Um, one is the concept of split inheritance. So in split inher inheritance, what you have is uh, the title going to one person while wealth goes in a different direction. And so this goes along with the religious belief, which is this cult of the ancestors, this belief that when somebody died, uh, you can see at the, the top, the, the mummy, uh, they, their remains would be mummified and the mummy's spirit would continue to have influence over this world. Uh, and so you might have a situation where a son inherits the title of, of Inca, of emperor, but the mummy inherits all of the wealth. Uh, and so that, that is the incentive to expand, because if you're the ruler, in order to get your own palaces and in order to have your own wealth, you have to conquer additional territory. So remember, in, a, in agrarian societies, wealth generation was pretty level. Uh, there, w there weren't 
increases in wealth that could be counted upon. And so one way to infuse your society very quickly with wealth was to take it from other people. And this is what the Inca do. They're expanding, you can see from Cuzco, they expand throughout the, the, uh, the Inca, the Aztec or the Andes range. Uh, and so that's the, the drive to expand. So the Aztecs driven to expand in order to get sacrificial victims, at least that's one theory. And the Inca driven to expand by this idea that the earlier rulers continued to live on in spirit form through mummies. And, uh, and you needed wealth for those mummies and you needed wealth for the new ruler. So as the Inca expanded, they developed an empire that's far more centralized than the Aztecs. Uh, and so we, we can see the socialist system as one element of that. So the map in the center shows the road system that the Inca have. And you can see uh, in the top, <clears throat> the middle picture, the runners, so that the, the roads were often paved. Uh, there are bridges spanning chasms. That, that is uh, evidence that they have consolidated control over the territory that they, they've conquered. They required the conquered people to use an administrative language, which was Quechua, the, the Inca language. So in, or, in order to be part of the government, you had to use that language. Uh, they did not, however, replace the, the most local rulers. And so we, we have kind of a parallel to some of the other centralized systems in, in Afro-Eurasia, like the, the Caliphate. Uh, and so the uh, people at the bottom who ran, let's say, villages or towns were allowed to, to stay in charge of their areas, but their children were brought to the capital of Cusco, and especially their sons were brought to Cusco, uh, where they were educated in the Inca way, which is part of the process of centralization, and also held hostage. If the parents back home rebelled, then they would kill the children, right? That's, that's how you maintain control. So go, coming back to socialism, um, you can see on the bottom right, the terracing of the mountains. That requires a lot of labor. And, and then you can see in the top right, Machu Picchu, uh, a city built at high elevation. And so the uh, idea is that farming these resources, producing cities, and, and the kind of differences in parts of the empire were significant enough that the government had to take control. And so one of the things that, uh, had we continued, we would have seen more of what the Soviet Union is. The Soviet Union's economy ultimately declines and collapses. And so there's, there's kind of a, a range that occurs with socialism. What we see in the Inca Empire uh, was a, the same thing, basically, uh, as what we saw in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. If you take resources that are being underemployed and you use them more effectively, economic production is going to go up. And that's what the Inca are doing here. So the terraced side of the mountain was farmland that hadn't been used before. The agricultural laborers would have been working far less efficiently before the Inca terraced that mountain. And so if you terrace the mountain and you grow potatoes, as the Inca did, then you're going to see production go up. However, over the long haul, there's the question of what happens when you maximize your use of resources. So what happens when the Inca terrace all the farmland they can terrace and use all the farmers they can use in order to grow food? At some point, the, the system is going to level off and then decline because there's no reason to innovate. And one of the rules of thumb of Inca socialism is you, didn't, you couldn't produce less than you were required to produce or else the government would punish you. But the government also didn't want you to produce more than you could produce. And because if you did produce more than you could produce, then you would, uh, you would take away from the labor of somebody else. You would, you would actually make somebody else lazy was the, kind of the, the accusation there. And, and so the, the, the problem with a socialist system kind of at its core is that it doesn't provide much incentive to get better. It's a, a problem that you are now experiencing, right? And when we take away grades as an incentive what is the incentive to continue to work hard? I mean, it, it might be something long range. So if you're taking the AP exam, maybe that's your incentive to work hard so you can get AP credit. But you probably know a lot of, of, uh, of students who are doing little to nothing now because they're, we've taken away the grades as an incentive. Uh, so for most people, they need some kind of outside incentive to work hard. 
where the Soviet Union experienced the same thing. When they maxed out on their use of resources, why would people work hard? Uh, there weren't consumer goods to buy, so th that's part of the reason that the Soviet system begins to decline. Uh, you are example, examples of the minority, right? Uh, you're internally motivated to work hard. And, and so you are showing up on Friday to lectures on a region that many of you hated more than any other, the Americas, right? So it's, uh, that's kind of what we're getting to here. So let's move on to the early modern system. And so I, I've mentioned many times how in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, keep that in your head because that means that until 1492, there's no European presence in the Americas. There is no connection between the Americas and outside areas. And I, I mentioned the Vikings. It's kind of a flash in the pan. It happens and then it's gone. Uh, and Similarly, until 1492, the Europeans do not have sea routes directly to East Africa or South Asia or East Asia. So 1492 is that magical date that if you keep track of it, it will help you to understand the developments in the world. So in 1492, Columbus sells the ocean blue. The Spanish hire him. He was an Italian uh, merchant, sailor, and so they, they hire him. They are persuaded that uh, he can solve their dilemma, which is that the Portuguese have begun to explore West Africa and have more or less established a monopoly uh, over sailing around West Africa. And so the Spanish feel like they have nothing to lose in financing Columbus in his voyage uh, to Africa or to Asia by going to the West, even though all of the educated people had calculated that Columbus's uh, Columbus's distances were totally off. And, uh, and, and so Columbus was lucky that he accidentally hit some islands in the Caribbean. Uh, if he hadn't, he would have died in the middle of the ocean. So he gets over here, uh, hired by the Spanish, expecting to find the Indies, which was a, Euro uh, a European term that meant everything from uh, India to the Spice Islands to Japan and China. Uh, he doesn't find those places. So he nevertheless continues to insist that he has. Uh, and, uh, and so it, as he's bringing stuff back, it's not pepper, the spice he was looking for. He doesn't have silk, he doesn't have porcelain. And so the, this is a profound disappointment. Uh, and so what we're gonna see is, is a shift that occurs where the Europeans are gonna say, uh, okay, well, we paid for this voyage of exploration. That was expensive. We need to make this pay off. We've gotta find something that we can extract from this area. So the Europeans, when they show up, have the advantages that I've listed here, guns, germs, and steel. So this is uh, Jared Diamond's book on the topic, where he uh, discusses how the people in the Americas being isolated have fallen far behind technologically. The Europeans are geographically lucky, and they, they are connected to uh, other societies by trade who had become far more technologically advanced. And so guns, based on gunpowder that comes from China. Uh, the germs, they come, the diseases come mainly from the livestock that had moved throughout Afro-Eurasia and the development of steel as well, a technology that originated outside of Europe. And so the Europeans are able to make this leap because they're bringing in Middle Eastern, South Asian and East Asian technologies. The Americans are unlucky because their insulation from the trading system has left them far behind. Uh, and so we, we tend to focus on guns as being the, the main uh, difference between Europeans and Americans, but it, the, the far more important uh, advantages that the Europeans had would be steel, uh, swords and armor. So you can see up there the armored person on a horse. It's kind of like a tank uh, in, in this time period. Guns were slow. You had to reload every time you shot. If you were skilled, you might be able to shoot three times in a minute. And then there's the biology of it. So we're experiencing a pandemic right now, and it's extremely contagious. Uh, and even still, we're, we're, we're seeing nothing like what the Indians look like. But it gives you an idea of, of what uh, happens to the Indians. Because in the pandemic we're going through with the coronavirus, you have uh, the coronavirus infecting certain groups of people. Right? So the people who are elderly are, are more vulnerable. And even there, uh, the, the pandemic hurts some, it impacts some people far, 
more than other people. And this is just a product of genetics. Some people are just genetically lucky and their genetic profile offers them a greater defense. Other people are more genetically vulnerable. What happens in the Americas is we have a fairly homogenous group of people that don't have the same genetic diversity we would see in Afro-Eurasia. And uh, we have not one epidemic spreading to the Americas, but a number of killers spreading simultaneously. Uh, and smallpox is the one we tend to focus on, but uh, measles and, and other diseases like that would have just wiped out resistance. Uh, now this wasn't even in some areas, more Indians were wiped out in some areas less. Uh, but we're, we're still not sure what the population of the Americas would have been prior to the Europeans showing up uh, because these diseases ran ahead of them. They would land in, in, uh, on the east coast of areas and uh, Native Americans would trade with other Native Americans who would trade with other Native Americans and they would spread the disease ahead of the Europeans. So it wipes out maybe 90 plus percent of the Native Americans in the area. And, and so the Europeans are able to take advantage of their technological uh, innovations and innovations that came from other places, as well as this biological advantage and conquer large empires. So small groups of Europeans wipe out the Aztecs, wipe out the Mayans, wipe out the Inca. Uh, remember, this was not the intent. The intent was to sail across the ocean and find Asia. And instead, what they find are these areas that they begin to conquer. And, and so you can put yourself in the mindset of Indians in this area, they would never have encountered outside people. And so they have uh, no idea who these people are. I mean, it, it, is, it is like the Europeans landed from Mars. It, it, they are that kind of, of uh, outsider to the Indians. Meanwhile, remember the Europeans have experienced people from Africa and people from South Asia and people from the Middle East and people uh, across the trading network from far and wide and they have this expansionist mentality anyway, this kind of crusader mindset that because they are Christian, they should spread what they believe is the one true religion by conquering other people. And so we end up with Europeans establishing empires. And so there's kind of this, uh, this experimentation that goes on as the Europeans expand. They experiment first with a version of a feudal manner, and that's an enc the encomienda. So when the Spanish show up in the Americas, what they're trying to do is bring the system that they already know, which is feudalism, without the disadvantages of feudalism from the perspective of a monarch, which would be nobility. And so the encomiendas were like a feudal manor uh, established in the Americas. Instead of European peasants, you had the uh, American Indians, and you had a person who ran the estate called an encomendero. The encomendero would have had uh, similar powers over peasant labor, Indian labor, as a noble would have over serfs. So this is a, a coercive labor system. Uh, but the theory was that the, incom the incomendero would only have the encomienda for his lifetime, and then it would revert back to the king. So no hereditary monarchy or uh, nobility was the hope. Well, that system is so exploitative that it actually drives Indians into the countryside. Uh, so Indians are dying in large numbers and Indians are just trying to get out of the way of this abusive system. It is so abusive that there is eventually a, uh, a book written by a, a priest, De Las Casas, uh, exposing the awful nature of the encomienda. So they, this eventually is gonna fade away and it's gonna be replaced by two other uh, semi-coercive or coercive agricultural systems. One is the hacienda. So in the interior, we tend to see a lot more haciendas. Haciendas, to a much greater degree than these other systems, tended to focus on self-sufficiency. So they would grow food that you needed to survive. Uh, that could be maize or potatoes. So remember, those were not luxury items. And if you were going to sail across the ocean, and, and, and a voyage across the ocean could take you, you know, somewhere around a month, six weeks, then you had better come back with something that could pay off. Uh, potatoes were not going to do that for you. Sugar would and cotton would. All right, so Hacienda is, still could use Indians as more or less forced labor, uh, kind of semi-coerced rather than coerced, uh, intended to be owned by people of European descent, uh, but weren't near, were, were not nearly as abusive as the encomiendas. And then there are the plantations. 
So the plantations are kind of these factories for producing one cash crop, uh, often how they worked. So you would max out on the production of something like cotton or sugar or tobacco, uh, or if you were lucky, you, know, you would have in your territory some kind of silver mine. And so the, the plantations, as Indians are dying, are shifting to African slavery. And this, at first, was not due to racism. It was just the Africans were available. The Ottoman Empire had expanded, cut Europeans off from a traditional slave force, which was the Slavs, and so the Europeans turned more to West Africans. But as they used West Africans as slaves on plantations, there's a racial element that does emerge. And so they, this results in a new form of slavery. All right, so now uh, take a minute and read this. Okay, so let me kind of break down what we've got going on here. Um, here is an American Indian. He's being interrogated by the Spanish. That's useful information. He's talking about an event that the Spanish lab label, the, the Pueblo Revolt, uh, because it's these Pueblo people in Spanish-controlled territory in New Mexico. So it's a, uh, a document that illustrates the resistance that we would have seen to European uh, control. So the, there was a, an uprising in the Caribbean by a group of people called the Maroons. Uh, so these uprisings did happen, even though the Europeans had this, this advanced technology. Uh, and so here, this describes that event. It's also a good document for, for showing kind of the influence of the circumstances. It talks about, the, the author says that uh, he is rebelling because uh, this guy came and told them everybody has to unite or they would behead all the people in the village. So he's saying, you know what? I didn't want to join the uprising, but I, I felt like I had no choice. Uh, it's awfully convenient for him to say to the Spanish, right? Uh, and then it talks about uh, the rebellion itself. And then it goes down to the, the bottom part where it talks about the reason for the rebellion. And, and it says that they wanted to be free from the labor they had performed for the religious, because you also have Catholic missionaries in, in the, the church. Uh, and, and, uh, and so this would be kind of that coercive labor expectation that the, the Spanish have. So the Spanish are going to take that old Inca Mita, and they are going to levy, levy it on the, the people living in the Americas and, and try to convince people that they're using a traditional uh, source of labor. All right, so that, that brings us to the Columbian Exchange. And, and so this is one of those things where, for the love of God, know the Columbian Exchange. It, it is arguably the most important thing that happens in the early modern period. Uh, it, it is, if we're looking at what impacts the lives of more people than any other single development, it is the Columbian Exchange. Uh, and so the Columbian Exchange is going to involve this exchange of plants and animals. So it has a tremendous environmental impact. Plants that grew only in the Americas will now grow all over the world. And so we'll see uh, you know, things like peppers take off in, uh, in Europe for sure, but in areas that Europe was trading with, like India and in China, the, the goods are slowly but surely going to trickle out there. So it is not a trading system. Often uh, students want to describe the Columbia Exchange as a trading system. It includes trade but it's bigger than a trading system. It's the total exchange of foods, of animals, of diseases, of ideas. Uh, and so remember, nobody's trading, or very few people, would have traded potatoes. And potatoes were goods that people learned about in, in being exposed to other people. Uh, and it was actually a hard sell getting people back in Europe to grow things like potatoes there's one story of a guy who tries to give potatoes away to farmers and get them to grow them, and nobody will take them. So instead, he puts a pile of potatoes in a public place and assigns these guards to pretend to guard them. Uh, and that makes them look valuable, so that all of a sudden thieves are taking them. And that's how the story goes that the potato catches on. 
Uh, but this is tremendously important. And so one of the things we're looking at here is the spread of disease, which we, we've gone over already. A disease vector is a fancy term for something like a mosquito, right? So mosquitoes are accidentally brought across the ocean. Uh, rats are accidentally brought across the ocean and they're going to spread diseases. Uh, and so we, we've just discussed smallpox already, but uh, it, things like malaria are going to come across. It, it, it is, uh, you know, all kinds of awful in that way. It's going to result in new blended beliefs. So we have, as part of the Columbian Exchange, Christianity coming across the ocean. Uh, so that's diffusion. And then uh, it's transformed. And so in the bottom right picture, this is a depiction of the Last Supper, Jesus and the Apostles having the Last Supper in Peru. Uh, and that's a guinea pig they're eating. So that shows the, the blending. And then uh, up in the top right corner, that's the Virgin of Guadalupe, which shows the uh, blending of a, a Christian figure with Mexican symbolism, the, the colors that were important to the Aztecs, the rays of the sun coming out from behind her. Uh, she's, she is depicted as an Indian. So there's kind of this, this, uh, this two-way dynamic with the Catholic Church. On the one hand, the Catholic Church was used by the Spanish in particular as an instrument of control. So in the, the passage... That, that, that I showed you, it talks about how they were rebelling against religious groups using labor. Uh, so the Catholic Church would have extended Spanish control out of the administrative centers. So there would have been a lot of Spanish uh, political officials in places like Havana, but very few Spanish officials outside of Havana. So the church extended the control outside of there. But on the other hand, we have people in the Americas basically making Christianity their own and changing it so it reflected the views of the people who lived here already. All right, so we start with the Spanish showing up, the Portuguese colonized Brazil, and then we have North Atlantic countries that are going to be, in the long run, far more successful at running these kinds of empires. Uh, and so that includes Britain, France, and the Netherlands. So those are the three main groups. Britain, France, and the Netherlands uh, were all far friendlier to business than the Spanish were. And so they tend to have more successful joint stock companies. Uh, and, and so as time goes on, we're going to have a lot more competition between European countries over these colonies. Uh, and so it starts with this competition between Spain and Portugal, and it's going to grow into kind of an extension of Reformation conflict that, that originates in Europe, and then dynastic conflict. So the Europeans are going to develop an economic system uh, over the the late post-classical and into the early modern called mercantilism. So mercantilism is an economic system uh, that, that fits very well with this colonization because in the mercantilist system, the whole point is to enrich the country. And so the belief is you can enrich the country by accumulating as much gold and silver as possible. To accumulate as much gold and silver as possible, you have to export manufactured goods as much as you possibly can and import only low-valued goods like raw materials. And so this fits perfectly with colonization because when you colonize a, a, a section of the Americas, now the colonial power, the, the metropole, can require that the colony produce the raw materials needed by the mother country, cotton, tobacco, uh, sugar, and buy manufactured goods from the mother country. So in a mercantilist system, you should basically create a wall around your empire, and Spanish colonies should only tra trade with Spain. Uh, it, there's a flaw in this system. It, it tends to, in areas that are wealthier, it tends to drive prices up. It tends to cause inflation because you have, you're accumulating more sil silver in particular. But the uh, it, it is fairly successfully applied in places like the Caribbean and in your other sugar producing areas. In places like the 13 colonies, where the northern 13 colonies were not economically valuable, the British for the most part didn't bother to apply mercantilism. Uh, this uh, would, have been, would have involved things like not applying the navigation acts that were passed in Britain. So in the long run, what this does is it creates a pattern of dependency. Uh, and, and so what we'll, we'll see kind of over the long haul is that even after 
parts of the Americas become politically independent, becoming economically independent is another matter. Uh, and so any area that's exploited in the way I just described is going to have a tough road to go down in terms of independence. Uh, so that is the, the, uh, that mercantilist system. The other thing that we see is this development of a new social system. So I mentioned uh, at the, the beginning, we were, we we're looking at how economic developments impact social systems. And so the, the caste system referred to uh, the, the Spanish and Portuguese system that differentiated based on race for the most part. Uh, and so you, you see on the top left corner, the variety of racial groups that emerge in Spanish colonies based on intermarriage and, and uh, in some form of racial mixing. And so the caste system uh, went something like this. At the top, you would have the peninsulares. Those are people of Spanish or Portuguese descent who were born on the Iberian Peninsula. So in other words, born in Europe. Then you would have at the next level down, the Creoles. Creoles were people of European descent, but they were born in the colonies. And so they weren't considered to be as high status as the people who came from Europe. The highest level positions in the colonies were reserved for the peninsulares. So a viceroy is a governor. The viceroy was a peninsulare always. And then below that, you would have these groups of mixed descent that we see in the picture. So people of mixed Indian and European descent we refer to as mestizos, and people of mixed European and African descent were referred to as mulattoes. Uh, and those groups were considered to be of a lesser status. And at the bottom, you would have Africans and Indians. And so the, the, the caste system represents kind of a broader imperial pattern. When people are conquered, the conquering group tends to put itself at the top of the, the social class system, which is what the Europeans do. In this case, the caste system, the caste system is reinforced by the political, economic, and religious systems that the Europeans are using. So the people who are at the top of the caste system are also at the top of the political system. They're the viceroys. They're also, generally speaking, your wealthiest Europeans, people who own most land. Uh, and they are also the people who tended to run the church. So the people who ran the church, remember, that's going to ultimately go back to the pope, who's in Rome, who's a European. Uh, and so this was a way of, of reinforcing European control. And it is, it is going to create a long-standing pattern of racism in the areas where it is employed. And so the uh, caste system will, for the most part, be abolished in the next period of time that we look at. But the uh, effects of the caste system are harder to get rid of. Okay, so that's the end of part one. You made it through.